hello everyone and welcome to this month's episode of Critical Decisions in Emergency Medicine podcast. With you is Dr. Danya Koja. I'm an emergency physician in the northeast of the United States. And I'm Wendy Chang, an emergency physician and neurointensivist in Baltimore, Maryland. And today we're going to be talking about the April 2022 issue of Critical Decisions in Emergency Medicine. And if you don't know what Critical Decisions is, what are you waiting for? Critical Decisions is ASAP's official CME publication. Each month, we talk about two lessons that are either bread and butter emergency medicine or things that are cutting edge. There are also a lot of other features, such as the critical cases in orthopedics and trauma, our newer section, clinical pediatrics, and as our listeners know, my favorite, the LLSA review. So for our first lesson of the day, we'll be talking about travel bug, fever following travel. Thank you to doctors Megan Nodorft froman and Elizabeth DeVos for writing this article. I guess now with international travel resuming, we'll be seeing more travelers-related illnesses, especially in cities that are big travel hubs. That's definitely true. I think the ones that we're relatively familiar with are like URIs and GI symptoms, and they actually are the most common. But there's so much more to it than that. There's malaria, hemorrhagic fevers all sorts of things that make you almost not want to travel. Almost. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> what do we need to know then? So there are some specific details that we need to ask about a patient's travel history. The geographic region of travel, the reason for travel, because it's going to give us an idea of what activities they did, the timeline of travel, possible exposures, pre-travel immunizations, and chemoprophylaxis. Just saying, oh, did you travel? And a yes and no is not enough. Another way to ask about the kind of the last two elements with the immunizations and chemoprophylaxis is just knowing if they visited a travel clinic in preparation or they just like freestyled it and decided to go on a random trip. I usually know to ask people when they travel, but I don't really think of asking them how long they stayed. But the evidence, which makes a lot of sense, suggests that longer trips are correlated with increased incidence of travel-related infections, which makes sense. Some specific exposures as well to ask about are like insect bites, freshwater swimming, ingestion of contaminated food or water, interaction with farm animals. Those are some specific exposures that we need to ask. The article has a fantastic table, table one, that divides the infectious diseases by region and the typical incubation period. So like less than 10 days, more or less than three weeks, or are we talking about like months and months? One thing to keep in mind as well, is that it's important to inquire what setting the patient was in, urban, rural, within the region. Being in a tent versus a five-star hotel is completely different. That makes sense. I may have to keep a copy of that table, you know, with your passport or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely a lot more details than I generally think of when I ask about travel history. But let's start with the most famous travel disease, malaria. Well, absolutely. Malaria is very famous. Basics are basics. It's plasmodium species. They're spread by the Anopheles mosquito, which is Aedes aegypti, which, by the way, is the same vector for a bunch of other febrile illnesses, such as dengue, yellow fever, Zika, chikungunya. So just because they saw the white striped mosquito does not mean that much. Most your, cases, Your eyes are that good? You can see the white stripe on the mosquito? Well, sometimes these mosquitoes are big. And, Wendy, mosquitoes love me. I am like, I'm better than a mosquito net. I am better than anything to have with you because I just walk near you and all the mosquitoes will come and bite me. So I get to watch them and look at them. And trust me, sometimes you can tell. <laughs> this is why I'm going to travel with you. <laughs> well, at least I'll have fun. Get bit, but I'll have fun. So the reason it's important that it's the same vector is that a lot of these diseases are actually going to pop up a lot in this conversation because there's a lot of similarity. And most cases of malaria early on actually present just like a good old viral illness, myalgia, fever, headache, and so on. Some patients may have like some splenomegaly, mild jaundice, abdominal tenderness. But a couple of tips that can help you differentiate between malaria and those other ones is that if muscle pain is severe, think of dengue rather than malaria. If the patient has a lot of muscle tenderness, think leptospirosis or typhus. Rashes are quite rare with malaria, except when you're talking about like falciparum DIC situation. 
And then if you see the petechiae, that's more of like your viral hemorrhagic fever. Other funky rashes, that's your like chikungunya, Zika, typhus, enteric fever, meningococcal septicemia, all of those. Those are some great tips to differentiate these illnesses uh, because like you mentioned, they can be quite similar. Absolutely. An important thing also to remember about malaria is that complications can develop rapidly. Things like encephalopathy, hypoglycemia, acidosis, acute renal failure, pulmonary edema, hepatic dysfunction, hemolysis, DIC, shock, basically a lot of really terrible things that can just develop rapidly from that good old viral illness that they initially came in with. Kids and pregnant people are more likely to have those complications. And remember, when you see these complications or the patient's parasite load is more than 5%, these are indications for intravenous antimalarials. Pills don't work. Got it. And we make this diagnosis with a blood film, right? Pretty much. The thin and thick blood smears give us our answer. However, if you have a really high suspicion, you should actually repeat them every 12 to 24 hours for two days to try to catch that phase when the malaria parasites are actually, you know, hanging out in the blood. There are also more advanced methods such as like PCR that may be available to you and you can, you know, give that a try instead of waiting around for those blood films to turn positive. Or you need a specialist to look at your blood smears. I don't know. When was the last time we looked at a blood smear? Oh, no, no, we don't look at it. We call the very nice lab people and say, please. (laughs) And they usually do a great job because like you said, we don't do this often. We don't request it often. So it has to be a really clear request. Hey, this is what we need it for. That's right. What about treatment? Anything new there? So we need to remember that resistance keeps going up. So for malaria falciparum, we need to make sure that we're using an artemisinin based compound because it's now considered the first line therapy. For p vivax or POVAL, the initial therapy is one, treating the erythrocytic forms, but also we need to give them primaquin to eradicate the dormant liver hypnozoites to prevent relapse. If you're not sure what you're supposed to do, the CDC has a malaria hotline during the like normal working hours and an emergency operations center to help outside of those hours to help you figure out what you need to do and what medications you need to give depending on the region. Okay, I'm going to call the CDC for help. Yep, sounds great. They are waiting for you. <laughs> 24-7. Now let's switch gears to hemorrhagic fever. What are these caused by? So hemorrhagic fever to begin with is defined as an acute fever that's less than three weeks duration in someone who's severely ill, plus two of the following. Either a hemorrhagic or purpuric crash, epistaxis, hematemesis, hemoptysis, blood in the stool, any other hemorrhagic symptom and not any known predisposing host factors for like hemorrhagic manifestations. The causes can be a lot. Viral, bacterial, rickettsial. I am not going to even bother to try these names in the article. But the most famous one in recent memory is Ebola. Got it. Fever plus two sources of bleeding. Maybe Ebola. What makes Ebola so scary? Well, it's pretty much the most virulent hemorrhagic fever out there. And it has a really high mortality. Plus, there's human-to-human transmission, which is why proper isolation and decon is incredibly important. The even scarier part about it is the early symptoms are similar to any other febrile illness, so you can't really tell them apart until they're super sick. And there's no specific treatment. Ugh. All right. Guess PPE forever. Sounds about right. (laughs) What about the less scary ones then? What about dengue? So dengue is actually the most common mosquito-borne illness worldwide. An infection usually starts like four to seven days after an infected mosquito bites a person. And it's actually called break bone fever due to the severe arthralgia and muscle pain. We should think of it when fever is accompanied by two or more of the following symptoms. Headache that's severe, retroorbital pain, joint pain, myalgia, Nausea, vomiting, swollen glands, rash. It's like really just a viral illness on steroids. Don't give them steroids. Um, (laughs) And then the patients can also present with either petechiae, abdominal pain, elevated LFTs, lethargy, restlessness. And those are some things that you can start to think of, of, hey, is this getting a little bit worse? 
because not everybody with dengue is going to come in with like hemorrhagic fever. I'm dying right now. Some can just come in with these, you know, break bone fever, feel terrible. It's dengue. And then everything is fine. But sometimes it turns into that hemorrhagic version of it. And for those, you have the triad of evidence of increased vascular permeability. So things like having pleural effusions and whatnot, having thrombocytopenia, so less than 100,000 cells, and spontaneous bleeding or signs of hemorrhagic tendency. And sometimes these patients start to go into shock. And that is the shock that's caused by dengue. Got it. I remember when preparing for work in a tropical care area, we had to do the tourniquet test. What is that? So the tourniquet test is basically a test where we take the patient's blood pressure and then keep inflating the blood pressure cuff. So obviously we need to use the like super old school stuff and keep it inflated for five minutes. And then you release the pressure for two minutes. And then you look at the skin beneath the cuff. If you see the petechiae, then count them. If it's 10 or more per one square inch of the skin, then it's called positive. And that just makes you realize that the patient has microvascular fragility and hemorrhagic tendency. All right. What else causes fever in travelers? So obviously we've covered like the super scary stuff. And then something to remember in somebody who's returning from travel, they may also have the things that are caused by non-travel related things. So we definitely need to think of that. (laughs) Earlier in this pandemic of the C word, it was considered a travel thing. Now it's just everywhere. So I don't think we should even talk about it. So how about we keep moving? I agree. (laughs) So let's keep moving. There are other respiratory illnesses, though, that are travel related. So there's like SARS, MERS, and so on. So it really depends on what's going on in the news and where the patient's coming from. Basically, they're just the same idea as COVID, where somebody comes in with what looks like a good old viral illness, suddenly goes into respiratory failure. There are other things that we need to think of as well, things like Q fever, which is transmitted from like aerosolized animal excrement or contaminated soil. Well, how about if people had unpasteurized milk? That's another place where you need to think about it and so on. Now, when people do things like boating and swimming, you need to think of schistosomiasis. And for these patients, they can have like eosinophilia and they can also have pulmonary infiltrates. It's usually a clinical diagnosis. That's usually when we think of like respiratory symptoms and fever. Now, when we're thinking of belly pain and fever, I think we're really good at thinking of traveler's diarrhea, which is like just gastroenteritis. It resolves within three to seven days. And what we tend to do sometimes is give people antibiotics and anti-motility agents to help like limit the severity of the disease and decrease the duration. The tricky part is, is that there with some variants, such as one of the enterohemorrhagic E. coli, so if somebody comes in with bloody stool, Starting on antibiotics can actually increase the risk of hemolytic uremic syndrome. So we should not really be starting everyone on antibiotics willy-nilly. Another cause of like gastro with fever in travelers is salmonella, whether it's typhi or paratypi. And these patients just come in looking like gastro. It's the only tip off really is the travel history. You get cultures and that's where you find it. What if they come back from traveling and they're altered? Well, of course you have I mean, to. There's lots of other reasons. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, there are some reasons. But of course you're going to ask me about altered mental status and neurological stuff. So people can have neuro complaints with fevers, altered mental status being one of them. And that's, of course, like malaria is one thing we, we need to think about. But there's a lot of infectious causes of encephalitis and meningitis that are not necessarily common where we are. So like Japanese encephalitis, equine encephalitis, tick-borne encephalitis, and so on. So that's definitely what we need to think of. And actually, like good old meningitis, I didn't realize that, you know, the rest of the world does not get meningitis vaccine all the time. That's how I grew up. So you know what? Meningitis is out there. Um, Another thing to think of with seizures is neurocystosarcosis and schistosomiasis, which can cause fever and seizure, but also rhyme, fever, seizure. So definitely think of that, definitely CT these people's brains, and hopefully you'll see what you need and be able to specifically treat them. If there's nothing abnormal, then you definitely should think of the encephalitis, get that LP, send that CSF for serology, and also if you're concerned about malaria, look for that as well. Okay. Now, do we need to report all of these cases? 
Well, some diseases are designated as either reportable or notifiable. If it's reportable, that means you have to call the CDC or like report it to them. I don't think you have to call it on the phone. But if it's notifiable, then it's voluntary. And each state determines what disease falls under which category. So if you work in multiple states or whatnot, just check the CDC website or check your hospital's guidelines to figure out which one it is. And there is a table called the National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System website. And that is where you would find that. Well, thank you, Danya, for taking us through this lesson. I learned a lot about scary things that can happen with traveling and a lot of information now I have to keep with my passport, apparently. I think the most common cause of fever following travel that we think about is malaria. And I think it was good to remember that if you have high suspicion for this, these patients may actually need repeated blood smears every 12 to 24 hours to make this definitive diagnosis. And that there are a lot more resistance that has since developed with these infections. And so if you have any questions about which therapies to initiate the patient on, you can always check the CDC malaria information. Just remember that if the patient does have severe malaria, such as with other organ dysfunctions, they're going to need a intravenous anti-malarial treatment. Obviously, there are also a lot of other causes of hemorrhagic fever, including the scary entity of Ebola that we all had to think about a couple years ago. But the most common mosquito-borne illness worldwide is dengue or breakbone fever. So think about this if you have a patient who is presenting with fever and two or more of the severe you know, myalgia, arthralgia type of symptoms. This article is full of pearls, so a lot more to definitely review and think about. Well, thank you, Wendy, for summarizing some of the great pearls from this article, and it's definitely worth reviewing because we're seeing a lot more of that. So moving on to our critical image, we have a case of a patient with granulomatosis with polyangiitis, which was formerly known as Wegner's granulomatosis, and a bronchial stent who developed a post-obstructive pneumonia. It's a good reminder that a lateral x-ray can be really helpful to look at the retrocardiac space. And on a normal lateral x-ray, the spine will generally look darker as you move lower down the vertebrae closer to the diaphragm. But an abnormal density like an infiltrate or pleural fluid will instead make that area of the spine look brighter. And as always, there's some great images to look at, including actually looking at the mucus plug itself, if, if anybody really, 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 really wants to look at that. But you can also just like look at the x-rays if you just want to do that. So moving on to less mucusy things, the critical EKG. This month is a great example of a second degree AV block type one, where we can actually see the increasing PR interval of the conducted P waves, but the non-conducted P waves are actually missed because they are buried within the T waves. So make sure to take a very good look at your EKGs so you don't end up missing the second degree AV block. Good tip. For our critical procedure this month, it is on dental splints using skin closure strips. And this is definitely a cool tip that I could have used recently. The article mentions other great pearls such as having the patient bite on a tongue depressor to help align the teeth. And don't forget to dry the teeth before you apply the wound closure adhesive tape. And then I'm assuming you're applying some sort of tissue adhesive drop by drop along the adhesive tape and teeth. And you probably want to make sure that someone's holding the lip because if you glue the lips to the teeth, you have not really fixed much. I mean, it can act as a splint. <laughs> <laughs> So, so maybe you should just do it the way it's in the article, not the way Wendy's currently suggesting. So <laughs> <laughs> don't try this at home, but it's a fantastic pearl. And moving on to more trauma, because I'm assuming that's the only reason you'd ever need to splint a tooth. Critical cases in orthopedics and trauma is a subtalar dislocation. And it seems like we're back to breaking bones. Yeah, more dangerous activities that we don't do. Because while this is generally rare and often with high energy mechanisms of injury like MBCs or a fall from height, this is actually a case of a subtalar dislocation from running on uneven pavement. So no running for me. 
Bees present with obvious displacement of the hind foot with the foot locked in supination or pronation, depending on whether this is a medial or a lateral dislocation. Reduction often requires procedural sedation. So you have to position the patient with the knee at a 90 degree flexion to relax like the gastrocnemius and the soleus muscles. And it's definitely important to get a post-reduction CT to make sure there are no occult injuries. And you must call ortho or podiatry for all the cases to have good follow-up. And remember, the only running you should ever do is running late. <laughs> Generally, that's safer. <laughs> I have never dislocated anything in my foot from that, let me tell you. And I'm an expert. As long as you're not physically running because you're <laughs> running late. <laughs> that is true. So moving on to what you would need to do to fix that foot, procedural sedation, and that is the topic of the LLSA review. Today we're reviewing an article by Miller et al. that was published in 2019's Annals of Emergency Medicine entitled Clinical Practice Guidelines for Emergency Department Procedural Sedation with Propofol. So basically, I heart propofol because it's great, it's short, it's anesthetic, it's, amnest it's amnestic, it's just like milk. It's amazing. That's right. Milk of amnesia. <laughs> <laughs> so it is considered deep sedation. And ideally, you should have a clinician dedicated to the sedation monitoring separate from the procedural list. It can be given as a bolus, which is what I usually use it for, uh, but also as an infusion, which I guess is gaining more popularity, which I haven't had too many experiences using as an infusion in non-intubated patients. Uh, but using it as an infusion can minimize the risk of respiratory depression, hypotension, and the potential suboptimal sedation with peaks and troughs because of the bolus dosing. Bolus dosing is usually 0.5 to 1 milligrams per kilogram with additional 0.25 to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram every 1 to 3 minutes as needed, whereas infusion dosing is usually 100 to 150 mics per kilo per minute. And you want to start lower for elderly patients and obese patients, but higher bolus dosing for children. Well, that's a great review. And I definitely have not done infusions in patients for sedation. But what about analgesia? Since Propofol does not have any analgesic properties, what are we supposed to do? Well, some prefer to use ketamine and propofol in a one-to-one -one mixture or ketofol, essentially. Or you can certainly use opioids, analgesics separately. So if you're using opioids like fentanyl, you want to administer it before giving the propofol to decrease the risk of respiratory depression. Makes sense. Any other considerations? You do want to be careful of the potential hypotension, especially in critically ill patients. And respiratory depression is actually more common in adults than children. I learned from the article that soybean and egg allergies are no longer considered contraindications. Great. So now um, Purpofol is vegan? <laughs> <laughs> it isn't vegan. But... <laughs> Fantastic. So speaking of vegan organic things that people like to do, um, our clinical pediatrics case is about pediatric THC toxicity. So this is a very scary presentation of a teenager who's presenting with altered mental status, headache, possible seizures, a GCS of nine, fixed mid-sized pupils, and then apparently it was THC toxicity. So, less scary cause, very scary presentation. That's right. So tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, is the psychoactive component of marijuana, Obviously, we're now dealing with, or not not now, but we've been dealing with legal forms such as hemp-derived THC that can come in gummies, oils, vape liquids, etc. And they're not FDA regulated on its purity and dosage, so that makes it hard to know, you know, what patients took and how much. And of course, you know, it's colorful packaging and the fact that it comes in gummy forms makes it particularly risky for pediatric ingestions. Totally makes sense. And quite scary. So toxicity can be like psychomotor slowing, lethargy. But then things that are scarier are like seizures, vital sign derangements, apnea. And there's no antidote. So basically, you just need to rule out any co-ingestants 
manage the seizures and supportive care until the body metabolizes it out. Which is a great segue actually to our second lesson of this issue, which is called tipsy turvy, pediatric alcohol poisoning. Thank you to Drs. Mara Rodriguez and Giothi Legacetti for writing this article. Now, alcohol consumption is actually increasing in our pediatric patients, which is unfortunate. So we should be familiar with the presentations, whether we're talking about intentional or accidental alcohol poisoning. Yeah, I learned from this article that about 11% of ethanol consumption in the U.S. are actually by children and adolescents. Yikes. I'm glad I'm not a parent. I hear you. (laughs) (laughs) And so the toxic dose for ethanol in young children is 0.4 milliliters per kilo, or a peak serum level greater than 50 milligrams per deciliter. So essentially, if you're dealing with a teaspoon or five milliliters of pure ethanol, that would be toxic for a approximately 12 and a half kilo, let's say 23 to 24 month old. Quite scary. That's just a tiny, tiny bit. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Lock up everything in the house, <laughs> including all these common household products that can contain ethanol, ethylene glycol, and methanol listed in table two. Jeez. So what are some signs and symptoms of ethanol poisoning that we should be aware of? Well, we've all seen an intoxicated patient before. Uh, the scary things we should be more aware of are the fact that it can cause bradycardia, hypothermia, certainly ataxia, respiratory depression, coma, and hypotension and hypovolemia can also occur with the increased urinary output. The issue is that toddlers and young children are most vulnerable to hypoglycemia. That's definitely a great tip to remember. We need to check those sugars more diligently than we do with adult patients. So how about ethylene glycol? Yeah, definitely. We often think about ethylene glycol ingestions and poisonings from things like antifreeze. And there are three stages of the intoxication that's outlined in table four. It's really based on the time since ingestion. Stage one is less than 12 hours since ingestion, and you're dealing with mostly neurological symptoms like headaches, lethargy, coma, and seizures. Stage two is 12 to 36 hours after ingestion, and this is the scariest part, which is cardiopulmonary symptoms, including pulmonary edema, respiratory distress, or circulatory shock. Stage three is greater than 48 hours, and this is when you're dealing with renal symptoms like flank pain, uh, kidney injury because of the metabolites and those calcium oxalate crystals. Definitely scary. Well, how about methanol? Well, methanol is similar in presentation to ethylene glycol in terms of patients can have abdominal pain, small respirations, the metabolic acidosis we've all learned about, also seizures and hypotension. Uh, but its key distinct symptom is vision changes or even blindness. Got it. So those are some great tips about the three types of alcohol we tend to see more commonly. How are we supposed to evaluate these patients? Well, generally, we want to check electrolytes to look for those type of derangements, hypoglycemia, like we talked about. And we're looking for things like anion gap acidosis and osmolar gap. But it's important to remember that anion gap metabolic acidosis actually develops late because it requires first the metabolism you know, of these toxic alcohols to actually form those metabolites. Getting drug levels would be helpful too. And you can also even look for calcium oxalate crystals in the urine. Not mentioned in the article, but some people have certainly used a Woods lamp to look for fluorescence of the urine as most antifreeze preparations have added fluorescein to help detect radiator leaks. But you want to be careful that there are certainly a number of things that can cause false positives and false negative findings in this. Such great tips. So let's say we figured out that this patient has ingested a toxic alcohol or ethanol. What are we supposed to do? Treatment is mostly supportive. The good news is that apparently ethanol is metabolized faster in children, twice the rate at 30 milligrams per deciliter per hour. Those are some great livers. <laughs> That's right. But obviously, like we said, a little amount is toxic for them. An uncommon uh, risk 
but it's still present, is the development of Wernicke encephalopathy. So you should consider dextrose containing fluids and thiamine supplementation. If you're specifically dealing with ethylene glycol and methanol, fomepazole is used to inhibit the alcohol dehydrogenase to block the formation of the toxic metabolites. If that's not available, of course, you can use ethanol since it has higher affinity as a competitive agent to the alcohol dehydrogenase. If there is significant acidosis from these toxic metabolites, you may need to give some sodium bicarb. And in most severe cases, you may even need to consider hemodialysis to actually remove the alcohols and their metabolites. Got it. This is such a great summary of alcohol poisoning in children, not just the toxic alcohols, but all of the alcohols. And it's definitely a great reminder that in little children, even a tiny bit of alcohol, so five mLs, can actually be considered toxic in a child that's like two years old. So definitely important to remember. It's definitely worth noting that children are more likely to develop hypoglycemia from ethanol poisoning, so it's more prudent to check sugars in them. And it was a good reminder of how to differentiate between ethylene glycol with the calcium oxalate crystals, renal involvement and so on, and methanol with the vision changes in blindness. A great tip is that why denying gap metabolic acidosis can be late because it requires the metabolism of the alcohol first, and then that's when that develops. So we should not really be waiting for that when we suspect that this is what may have happened. In these patients, if it's just ethanol, we need to treat them supportively. If it's ethylene glycol and methanol, we need to start them on femepazole or ethanol infusion, which is super old school, but sometimes you just have to do what you have to do. Manage the acidosis and call your intensivist because these kids are very, very sick. Yes. And call your poison center for help if needed. Yes. Mr. Yuck. <laughs> So for our drug box this month, it is on gabapentin. It is FDA approved for post-herpetic neuralgia and partial seizures. We definitely see it used in many other applications such as neuropathic pain, fibromyalgia, restless leg syndrome, or even adjunctive treatment for opioid dependence. The evidence for its use in acute pain is limited. Uh, Some good reminders on dosing is that this should be titrated. Usually you want to start somebody on 300 milligrams total dose daily and add 300 milligrams daily. Some common side effects are dizziness, somnolence, and ataxia. And there's even some evidence for risk of suicidality and uh, the potential uh, symptoms of withdrawal with sudden discontinuation. Such a great reminder that gabapentin discontinuation leads to withdrawal and can totally and absolutely suck. So we should be pretty careful about that. And then last but not least, our tax box this month is aconite poisoning. So apparently, um, Harry Potter fans may be familiar with this, which is wolfsbane or aconite and its use of its flowers in potion making. But since um, I don't make any potions, I have no idea what's going on right here. And apparently the root is very toxic with just two grams being potentially lethal. So it's absorbed rapidly after ingestion and the half-life can be up to 24 hours. It's a cardiotoxin, it's a neurotoxin, so it's badness all around. Numbness, weakness, dysrhythmia, hypotension, respiratory paralysis, You can actually test for it in urine and blood, but it's usually a send out test. So please don't sit around waiting for that. Treatment is supportive. If it's an oral ingestion, then think of charcoal. Otherwise, just atropine for bradycardia, nor epi for the hypotension if not fluid responsive, amiodarone or flicanide for the VTAC, and cardiopulmonary bypass if the person has refractory hypotension. Now, if asymptomatic, they can be observed at home and not at Hogwarts. So, because that's probably not a good idea. (laughs) Yes. I don't know about capacity at Hogwarts, though. (laughs) I don't know. They're on yellow. It's fine. (laughs) Well, Wendy, thank you so much for taking the time to go through this issue with me. I learned a lot, as always. Our dear listeners, we hope you had as much fun listening to us as we've had recording this. 
We hope that you find the Critical Decisions publication and our podcast always informative, often enlightening, and never boring. Reach out to us on Twitter and share with us your thoughts and your comments. My handle is at Danya Koja. Mine is at EM underscore NCC. And until next month. Bye-bye.